What's going on everyone? Welcome to a brand new episode of the Rubby Muscle Podcast. This is episode 84 and in this episode we're going to bring about a full picture to our basics and principles series. In our last two episodes we discussed about how um, the principles and the basics are really all that matter when it comes to getting real results with your training and your diet. And in this episode, we're going to help you understand how the principles and the basics apply to your recovery because uh, recovery has been a hot topic at the minute in the fitness industry and there is no more um, section of the fitness industry where it applies to more than you rugby players because obviously we want to recover, we want to get the best workouts, we want to get the best results we can from our training and our nutrition, but this this like applies a hundredfold when you factor in the fact that a lot of you guys that are listening are have you know you're experiencing the equivalent of a car crash every single week in season and you're trying to get the best out of your training in the off season so that you can keep recovering, keep getting better and keep making progress. Once again I'm joined by the latest addition to TJ Strength Big Nick Whiteman and we will be discussing all the different techniques uh protocols, things that you need to pay attention to to make sure you are recovered in order to get the best results and perform your best on the rugby pitch. Which brings me to our free guides that you can get at rugby-muscle.com. That's the free physique, nutrition, crash course video series, the 50 free conditioning sessions and the TJ Strength Supplement Guide that is regularly updated. And once again, you can get them on rugby-muscle.com. And one last request I have before we get into the episode, if you've enjoyed this podcast, if you've enjoyed anything that we put out, please uh, do us a favor and do your friends a favor and share it with them. We're really trying to put out the best rugby, strength and conditioning, fitness information that we can. And that relies a lot on you guys being good teammates and sharing it with your friends so they can get the best benefit as well. Now, let's get into the episode. All right, guys, so we are back with Nick, the most impressive beard in the game, the biggest beard. Biggest beard in the game, would you say, mate? Uh, I don't know anyone with a bigger beard, so let's go with it. Yeah, it's it's pretty huge, and it's like most people that have beards that big, uh, they get it's like scraggly, or they do the, the whole... Have you considered that, the old plat thing going on? Um, I, you know what? I can't get the sides to reach the middle yet, um, and because it's so thick... If I leave them out, it looks retarded. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to the plat one day, but not yet. Yeah, it's a lot It's a lot of effort though, I can yeah. imagine. Yeah, and the plat will help that, but it's all good. So yeah, today, as I've already said, we are going to be talking about um, the, like, the basics of recovery. And again, why this is important, what are the principles related, how do we, like, how, how can we figure out if something is bollocks or can we rationalize it to see if it works? Um but as always, before we get right into the, the meat of the podcast, um, it's time for the fact of the week. Oh, I didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> uh, so the fact that I just remembered is yeah. uh, Viagra, if you mix it in with water, can actually help flowers last longer, uh, obviously in a vase or something like that. Really? Yeah, uh, up to a week. That from is a great memory. fact. For who and how did they? I mean, is it the same sort of application? You know, like a like a wilting flower is like a flaccid knob. So, um, you know what I mean? You know what? I didn't actually look too far into it. Um, <laughs> uh, my main question at the time was who put Viagra in a vase right. and then figured it out. Exactly. Where where yeah. did it come to that? Yeah, like it's. Uh, I guess it's like the first person who ever discovered milk from a cow. Yeah, we're not going to get into that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't even know where do we, we. That's a rabbit hole for another time, I think, mate. It is. It is indeed. Let's uh, let's let's go straight into it and let's talk recovery. So, recovery is like a real hot topic, especially like it, it's a big hot topic in fitness, but especially when we're talking rugby, and like that makes sense, right? Because what other sport do we have people not wearing pads? I mean, I hate that argument because actually in American football, the pads, like, if anything, they make it more brutal. Yeah. But, but you know, what other sport do we have this amount of collisions and, you know, they measure the 
guys bodies especially in the top level after games like they're equivalent to like that of a car crash in some people the forces that go through so oh yeah definitely yeah. so recovery um, I think is they've even important. um had people survive car crashes that shouldn't have because they played contact sports so like it's you know having done that for years and years on end actually your body adapts to it as well yeah for sure um and i guess that's where we'll start off is like before we even get into the basics understand that if you're playing rugby every week almost no matter what you do like there's a good chance you're going to be sore right and and there's no yeah. there's no fix to not feeling sore it's like like we just said it a lot of it can be equivalent to a car crash so if you got into a car crash you know once a week like you're going to be hurting and there's not like you know it's not like someone gets into a car crash and goes hey uh, can I get can I get those Norma Tech pants or can I wear or can I, um, you know, go in an ice bath and, oh, I'm still sore. Well, yeah, you were just in a car crash, you know? Exactly. Um, I think it's something that you, as a rugby player, you just accept. Um, and, yeah, you know, the first game of the season probably hurts more and takes more recovery than the second and then subsequent games. But every game, even that last game of the season after, you know, 15 weeks on the run, it still hurts. You still have to recover properly. Yep, for sure. I, I think the worst one I've ever experienced is like the neck and sort of trap uh, doms that you get from that isometric hold in a front row of a scrum, like when I first played yeah. sevens, because you're just not used to it from being a number eight or a seven and then going straight into sevens and, and being in the front row. Even if you're just playing against other, like if you get a couple big boys, it, it, your neck is ruined the next day and the day after that. And there's, there's yeah. just no way to prepare for it. No, that's why most front rowers have no neck at all. Uh, they just go straight from shoulders to head, uh, so they don't get pain there. Yeah, I agree. Um, but yeah, so with that caveat aside, like you're going to be kind of sore anyway. Let's talk about the different things that you can do in order to recover your best, and you know, to get back to playing your best or training at your best. Um, yeah, and so. The first thing that you have to understand with recovery is like there's a reason that you get worse or there's a reason that everything drops or you're sore or whatever and you can't perform the same level is because your body has been broken down in order to come back stronger. So we're talking again like that stimulus recovery adaptation curve that occurs. Exactly. And it's um, important to understand. It's the same as an injury really. Yeah. Um, your body is slightly injured for a certain amount of time. And uh, I find the best way to manage recovery is to do similar things what you do as to what you do uh, with an injury. So that rice, the rest, ice, compression, elevation, it's not exactly the same, but those principles can be applied to just a sore body after a game. And it helps with that recovery immensely. For sure. And then like it, but what I was going to say there was like, it's still, not quite the same because you want to get a little bit worse in order to get a little bit better. Like, Oh yeah, definitely. Um, you know, with an injury, it's not something you want. Whereas with, no. uh, you know, the stimulus you get from a game or from training or whatever, uh, you need that and you're looking for that so that you can adapt and, and become better the next week. Yeah. The key difference between an injury and training is training is always going to be self-imposed for a purpose yeah. of, not just getting back to your baseline. Your your goal of training is to go dip, have a dip, and then you go back above where you were before because your body has been broken down and it comes back stronger. Whereas an injury, like, yeah, you can come back stronger from an injury and that happens to, you know, many people. Some people have it as long-term weaknesses, but if you re rehab it right, you can come back stronger. But the, my, the, the most important thing from an injury is to just to get back to your baseline. Exactly. And... Um, um Go on, mate. I was going to say, and nobody trains or plays rugby to stay at a baseline. You know, everyone's looking to progress. Yeah, you're always looking to get better. Um, and like I say, sometimes injuries, like it's it's rare that you know it's not really spoken about, but there is a there is a case for having an injury if you treat it right. Can you can like bulletproof that injury for like in the future? Like I've seen people with that have uh, constantly dislocated a shoulder. And so I've taken it into the gym and we've done, you know, a lot of rear delt work, a lot of trap work, a lot of reinforcing that shoulder. And 
that shoulder's now, because of the, the work we've put in to get back from that injury, is stronger than ever before. Um, yeah, man. Have, have you ever himself. arm wrestled someone who's had a shoulder reconstruction? But have they had a shoulder reconstruction because they sprained their shoulder doing arm wrestling? No, no. Um, <laughs> like, usually, the, uh, so I've, my experience is all with AFL players because they always dislocate their shoulders. And uh, they, the guys who rehab properly and the guys who actually recover and come back and play AFL again, they'll be half my size and they'll smash me in an arm wrestle just because their rotator cuff is so strong now from all that rehab. Yeah, that makes sense. I've done the same thing with my, I've had the same thing with my hamstrings. I remember when mm-hmm. I was like 14, 15, I pulled my hamstrings like two or three times over the case, over the course of like two years. And then ever since then, I've always had strong hamstrings, like yeah. never really been tight, never really been weak. Like they've always been good for me. So, yeah. I, I had a um, tendinopathy last year and, um, it, that's the sort of thing that, you know, I, I've got mates and, and friends who are athletes who've had them for three years and they can't get rid of them. But once you get rid of them, it's stronger than ever. Yeah, for sure. Um, but going back to this whole thing about, you know, the training is for a purpose of getting better. Um, that's the easiest fix you can make for your recovery is just to not train as much or as hard or as push it as you know, just reduce your overall training volume. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it, it kind of depends on what what aspect of recovery you're aiming for. But yeah. like you obviously, it's not going to be good for recovery to go and play another game of rugby straight away. And that's, uh, you know, part of the problem that sevens players have is that they're backing up so frequently. Yeah, actually, let's, let's, let's dial this back a little bit and talk about... Um, the, the overall purposes of recovery, like two different ways really that we're trying to think of it. And we've, we've sort of touched on it already, but I want to really nail this down. So in season and rugby recovery, right? Yeah. Our whole purpose is to get our bodies back to 100% come game time. Or even better, get them 100%, you know, come, come training so that we can train real hard and then go to a game and play even better and do all that. Um, yeah, exactly. It's, it's not like you don't want a big dip in performance during the week. You definitely don't want any sort of dip in performance for one Saturday. You want to be at your best as often as you can. So you need a lot of recovery. But if we look at it from the other point of view, um, the other purpose of recovery is so that you can event you can come back stronger. So you might want to take a little bit longer to get back so that you get the adaptations because. A lot of the time, if you recover too quick, and this has been shown in the research, so if you use, um, we're going to get onto this at the end of the podcast, the last uh, principle we're going to look at, or the last thing we're going to look at is like ice baths, massages, those Mm -hmm. sorts of things. They can sometimes, and maybe not massages as much, but definitely the ice and the heat recovery, those sorts of things, Mm -hmm. they're good at getting you back to your baseline, but they won't get you back stronger than you were before. No, definitely not. And if you're, remember, if you're just training, like your whole purpose of training is to get better than before, then by using these other modalities or using this other other line of thinking for your recovery, you're actually, you're defeating the whole purpose of your training and you're going mm-hmm. to shortchange yourself. So, you know, there's recovery for, for games, recovery for in-season, and then there's recovery for off-season where you're actually you know, or, or recovery just to get better, where you're, you're taking a loss sometimes. You're taking the fact that you're going to be worse because eventually you'll come back stronger, whereas you're not going to play crap, beat yourself into the ground for two weeks in a row, play really poorly for two games just so that you can peak for or come back stronger for a third game. That wouldn't no, make exactly. any sense. I think um, and inherently during the season, you pick up stuff that you can't recover from in a week, um, and that's where things like ice baths and stuff do come into it yes. to try and get you back to that baseline so you can perform in a week because you're time limited during the season. Um, in the off season, you can afford to take longer and you know look at things from a, a bigger perspective and you know actually put the time into recovering properly and fully. So the next time you play rugby, which hopefully is in you know weeks or months' time, you're back at 100. percent Where I find that as you go through the season especially coming towards the end of the season, unless you've had some weeks off for whatever reason, um, you're pretty much ending up playing at 90% and that's your new baseline in the season. So you need to get that back up at the end. 
Yeah, perfect. Um, and then that leads us quite well on to um, the two different types of recovery that I'm thinking of as well. Like, there's two ways that for all of this stuff that you can handle it, and there's like proactive recovery in that it's part of your everyday, like what you do. It's your, you know, you do it. Um, it's part of your routine, I guess would be the best way yeah. to describe it. It's proactive. Like you're making sure you get it in all the time. It's, it's always there. Reactive mm -hmm. is, oh shit, I've dug myself into the ground. How can I get out of this? And how can I get back to feeling normal again? So, yeah, definitely. so with that, we'll try and give two examples for each of them. And the first one, well, the first real theme that we want to touch on with recovery is training volume because your training volume is what beat you into the ground in the first place. So it's really important that we start there. Yeah, definitely. Um, your so your in gym training and your uh, out of gym training, so like your actual rugby training and stuff, yeah. it all needs to be taken into account when you're looking at your recovery. Um, you know, in season might not be the best time to try and build new muscle because of the amount of work it takes to do that. It also might not be the best time to try and PR your squat, for example. Yeah, it's not the um, best time to try anything really new. No, um, and that's you know in the gym stuff and the stuff that's off the field you're not looking to increase your performance with that. You're looking, you, you need to use that stuff to uh, complement your performance on the field rather than trying to, to progress at both at the same time. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's just like, you know, some people I'll get messages every now and again and be like, Oh, you know, I'm, I, I need actually, you know, Dara won't mind me shouting him out. He's former friend of the pod. He, mm -hmm. um, he was, t he, uh, messaged me, the other day and he was like oh um have you got any like tips on recovery here i'm training you know six times a week for rugby and then i'm five times a week in the gym and i've got games and i'm like dude that like if i if i was in charge of your training i'd be like right you probably want to train a little bit less or you taper some of those sessions or whatever yeah. it is but the reality is if you're doing too much work that you cannot recover from you can't eat your way you can't sleep your way you can't uh ice bath your way out of that hole like you people that do train at really high volumes will build up to those like you you can say you do 20 sets a week on average like mm -hmm. not even per body part say like per upper body right you do mm -hmm. 20 20 sets a week then especially in season it's important don't to don't just go oh this new program says i've got to do 80 sets a week like obviously you're not going to recover from that you're a much better idea a much more strategical way a much more proactive way of doing it would be to add in one set each week until you get to the point where you're like right now i really feel like this training is beating me up a little bit and then you can yeah. you figure out what your maximum recoverable volume is yeah and we spoke about that on the last podcast um if finding that maximum recoverable volume um and you know most of the resources on the internet are about people who are training for hypertrophy or powerlifting or something like that. But when you're talking about someone who's training for rugby or any field sport, really, um, you've got to take into account the mandatory sessions. So you can't, you know, tell your coach, oh, I'm not coming to training Tuesday, Thursday, because I've got a hard uh, squat this session. This, yeah, week, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this week's my peak week or this yeah. week I'm overloading and, and I just can't afford it. Like that's, that's just not how it rolls. Like, you have to do those Tuesday, Thursday sessions. And as I said before, your gym training needs to complement that. And the complement to that might be not doing gym training that week or only doing lifting 50% like that week. Yep. yep. I, I, absolutely. I even said the exact same 50%. Um, and that's where you're almost forced to be reactive with your training. And I do that a lot with my clients that are my athletes that are in season like I'll say, if you had a, you know, if you, if I am I, if I'm expecting you to train on the Wednesday after a brutal Tuesday session, if that session is brutal, we'll do a reactive um, deload almost, and we'll just take everything at fifty percent, and we'll just get the body moving. Yeah. If if it's a easier session, you know, sometimes even Tuesday sessions, you know, they get cancelled because of weather, or you do a video session, or whatever it is. Sometimes it isn't a brutal one, so. That's our time when, oh, right, now you are fresh. Cool, let's take advantage of that and let's push your body hard. Yeah, when I run S&C for teams, um, if they've got a gym session one or two days after a game or even one day after a training session, um, the general rule, so they'll have a couple of different things they can follow of their own, but the general rule is if you're beat up from the training session, 
then you need to do something. So at a minimum move. But if you can manage it, do an upper body session. If the training session wasn't that hard, do a lower body session because these are the, you know, obviously the more taxing sessions. And so you know pretty much straight away after the session how you're going to feel the next day and you yeah. can prepare for that, the Wednesday training uh, gym session or the, even the Monday gym session after a game. Yeah, beautiful. It's just about being a bit more, like you have no choice. Like I said, you have to be a little bit reactive, which also means, and that touches on why you said, hey, you know, you can't just um, try and like loads of random new things or expect to hit massive PRs in season because you want to program somewhat conservatively. So mm -hmm. if you if we're talking about maximal recoverable volume, you wouldn't program at your maximal recoverable volume because you you, you never know when, you know, play, say you, your team has a shit game on Saturday and then Monday and Tuesday the next week or, or Wednesday next week, whenever your coach decides to, to flog everyone. Like, yeah. You know, there's nothing that you can do about that. You can't say, hey, coach, nah, I'm not going to do that, mate. It's uh, Yeah, until, I, I did heavy squats yesterday. I can't run today. Yeah, until so, we get like a head off. coach that does all of this, which, you know, one day we're working on it. Um, <laughs> like, it just it's just nothing. That, there's not much that you can do about it. So yeah, yeah. program somewhat conservatively. Any off-season, you can program a little bit more aggressively. But still, again, if you're not recovering, you have to – adjust your training volume accordingly that's that's the easiest way to make sure that you can get in the recovery exactly sweet next two points we were gonna we're gonna address here in, in our second tier of um like uh recovery principles i guess is um nutrition and sleep so we'll touch on nutrition real quick yeah yeah so um it, it's always going to depend on what you're recovering from but the the quick gist of it, um, and even at the top level of, of all sport they do this, is to get in uh, fast digesting protein and carbohydrates as soon as you can after like a game, for example. Yeah. Um, and this is assuming that, you know, after a game, you're completely depleted of energy and, and mostly uh, your glycogen stores. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that part of nutrition comes in really importantly there. But the thing that often gets overlooked is the hydration as well. Yeah. Um, it's, it's super important to get the fluids in and then also getting that sodium back up um, and, and balancing out these electrolytes again. And if you're cramping after a game, your electrolytes aren't right and you need to do something about that, whether it be more potassium, more sodium, both. Uh, and, you know, these are the, the big key things and the most immediate acute things you can do after a game or after a massive session uh, that are going to help you recover faster sooner. Yeah. Um, and then how would you view the uh, principles that we spoke about about nutrition in in this uh, in this recovery sort of light? Yeah, so um, all the principles still apply. So um, you know the sustainability one, it, it's not so important immediately post training. Like obviously, especially because they're fast digesting carbs and proteins, they're probably things that you enjoy eating anyway. Yeah. Um, that's true. Your calories, adhering to that, um, you can almost forget about calories in that immediate post-game or, or post-session window. Not to say that calories don't matter, but you probably burn enough calories in the last 80 minutes that it's going to be difficult to replace them without feeling sick anyway immediately. Um, then as far as the macro breakdown, the protein and the carbs are going to be important. I'd keep your fats well away from a game. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and even for any performance diet, your fats are pretty minimal anyways. Uh, what was the next one? After? Oh, your micros, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about them straight after a game. Uh, look at that over the course of a week and not so much over the course of hours or even a day. Yeah. Um, and then your nutrient timing is probably the big one here. Uh, and it's probably the only time where nutrient timing really becomes important is, you, especially if you're in season, you've got a game in a week. So... That means you've got training sessions you've got to do during the week and you need to recover as soon as you can. So, you know, within one or two hours of that game or that heavy training session, you need to get in those carbs and proteins. Yeah, that, that it, sort of the way I see it is like it, it brings us back to when we were talking about how it's all a spectrum. And every mm. now and again, yeah, you can justify, hey, I need to get this in now and, and because nutrient timing becomes really important if you're going to yeah. beast yourself. And again, this is, again – like we said in the in the nutrition podcast itself, this is like high level, you know, advanced sports performance type of talk. When yeah. we're talking 
uh, off season, you know, timing is you know, your recovery isn't absolutely critical. You still want to be able to recover so you can train as hard and grow. That's mm-hmm. where we then look at the principles of nutrition and we say, actually, these are probably in a good order because we want to eat a certain diet that we can continue to help us recover from. If whereas if we do, you know, say we do a super high volume uh, training program. Uh, the, with the expectation that we're going to put on a couple pounds of muscle at each month, mm-hmm. then we might have to eat a lot. We might have to eat so much that it's unsustainable. And as soon as you stop, then you lose all that muscle. So that's when it, you want to take another step back and you're like, right, I need to keep this sustainability to eat this many calories so that I can always recover. Exactly. Um, and so when it's like that, it still boils back to the bigger picture and the basics and the principles. Yeah, definitely. Everything we said in the nutrition podcast is still relevant to your recovery uh, as far as nutrition is concerned. And, you know, even to the point where consuming stuff that's higher in carbohydrates and lower in fats, that's going to have a better impact on your recovery than something that's higher in fats and lower in carbohydrates. And that's why. Yeah, that's about uh, the only time like I'm really like low fat uh, is around an important performance is because fats just take a lot longer to digest like we said before they keep you feeling fuller or whatever yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're stuck in the stomach they're just harder to digest so when mm-hmm. you when you've got a game you don't want to be digesting any food you want every piece of energy in your system already you don't want to be trying to digest it you don't want any blood trying to help with that exactly and and actually one thing we didn't mention in the nutrition podcast was fiber and yeah. that's something i would keep away from those games or from that recovery period as well, well we sort of touched um, on because it because once the again it's just slowing down the absorption of the macronutrients that are important at this point yeah we sort of touched on it with the micronutrients where like especially mm. in season like when we look at the sustainability standpoint it's actually it's we're not it's not that bad to not eat uh, a boatload of vegetables and fruits on game day if we're doing enough like all the other six days yeah, exactly. Uh, it, nutrition doesn't reset every 24 hours. It's a constant thing. And, you know, you can make up for one day, another day if you need to. And again, this is where we can be a little bit uh, reactive in that we can judge like, I, and, I, and I've done it with some of my people that I've tried to, um, they've been on a like, semi-aggressive cut in season. And, you know, you grade your performance out of 10, like ha- not how well you did, but how hard you really feel- felt like you pushed yourself. Yeah. Because, you know, the recovery for a winger who touches the ball twice in the rain is going to be different from, uh, you know, a flanker in a, in a real hot, sunny day where it's just nonstop running, you know? Yeah, exactly. So grade your performance out of 10. That's how many, that's the, your calorie allowance or your... Um, carb allowance that you would do for the recovery yeah and if you if you're adding any uh it would probably be carbohydrates anyway if you're adding any uh any macronutrient to aid recovery figure out what it is like the best you can and add that as soon as possible to that training so that it actually gets used for that, some of that recovery because it, you you will recover over like the next couple of days anyway and there's no point adding say 600 calories of carbs you know, two days later, just because you wanted to save it for, you know, whatever day you wanted to go out for dinner or whatever. Beautiful. Um, yeah, spot on. Now we're going to talk about sleep. Um, yeah. Let's touch it real quick. Uh, it's like, duh, you need to sleep to recover. It's like the most important thing. Um, like, we've seen six to eight hours, like, everywhere. It, you know, and everyone is different. You could just grade out your energy levels day to day, but it's something that... This is something that you kind of have to be really proactive with. You have to monitor your sleep. You have to log your hours and, and notice, you know, when you feel bad, a lot of times, like since I've started to track my sleep, I noticed my unproductive working days and my unproductive gym sessions are almost identical to the same days where I've got five to six hours sleep as opposed to seven or eight. Exactly. Mate. Um, caffeine can only do so much. Yeah. It, six hours is the absolute bare minimum and that's still not even enough. Um, you know, we, we should be looking at anywhere from seven hours upwards. Yeah. Um, and, and it depends on things like age and, uh, the type of, of person you are. Um, if anyone's ever read why we sleep, um, that's a really good book. I think it's by like Matthew Walker or something like that, but it's a very good book. It explains all the stuff to do with sleep and, and how it helps us recover, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
but basically different people need different amounts, but yeah. eight hours is, is there for a reason. Like most people are around that. Um, and on average, everyone's around that anyway. Uh, there was a study um, recently that showed injury rates go up if you get less than eight hours sleep. Yeah. Uh, and that was done in athletes as well. So it, it is important, but it's not as important to recover. It's also important to stop you from getting injured and then needing to recover more. Yeah, beautiful. And I mean, we'll do a whole podcast episode on uh, sleep later down the line. Maybe. but because it's, it's so important. There's so many different things that you could take to consider. But really, like for this episode, for recovery's purposes, just make sure you really think about it. Like, yeah, you know, getting an extra hour of sleep when you've got five hours sleep is going to do you, um, you know, a million times more benefit than fucking around on a foam roller for 20 minutes before you oh, squat. I, I would recommend if you're not getting uh, probably at least seven hours sleep, that take an hour from the gym and put it if that's the only hour you can get yeah leave an hour out of the gym and sleep instead like it's going to do you more benefit to be able to sleep for that extra hour than it is to train for an extra hour yeah being underslept makes you more stressed um Mm. it dehydrates you um it actually i don't know if it dehydrates you i think i just made that one up uh it definitely makes you hungrier yeah i was gonna say that it definitely makes you hungrier it makes you more irritable like i say more stressed all of this stuff at, um also it makes you uh partition your nutrients poorly so yeah um there has been some evidence to show that insulin sensitivity uh, is negatively affected when you're which means you can't sleep. build as much muscle or recover as much muscle and you can certainly store more fat none mm-hmm. of these are good things get your sleep in be proactive about it Definitely. and then the last thing i wanted to touch on with this podcast is our performance related recovery methods so this is that you know you've seen that like uh, that drill thing that everyone uses now the, oh, power, yeah. the, the, the jigsaw with a ball on the end of it yeah and yeah. then there's, um, you know, people I, I've had, I used to have a, my physio at the, when I was playing for the Raptors used to use a, uh, a buffer, like an actual buffer to, yeah. to do it. Um, it works just, really well. Yeah. I saw Eddie Hall using one of them once. Yeah. Foam roller, <laughs> massage. Um, we're also going to add in ice baths, the recovery pants, all this sort of stuff, all these new, uh, recovery things that are coming out. Uh, um, actually before I give my opinion, Let's hear your opinion, Nick. Well, this is where that, um, how I was saying before, it's similar to your recovery uh, for an injury comes in. So the rest, ice, compression, elevation. I swap elevation out for um, massage, and that covers you know everything from soft tissue to uh, EMT. Yeah. But uh, essentially, you, that's the all the extra stuff that gets you just that little bit extra back to baseline, though. It doesn't get you any anything further than that. Um, and things like ice bars, for example, um, very widely used, but unfortunately, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen the cryo chambers and stuff like that now. Yeah. there's all been debunked. Yeah. Like the cryo chambers do sweet fuck all. Um, the, an ice bath is all you need. Uh, and even then, you, I think it's 12 degrees Celsius is like the ideal temperature for an ice bath. So, if you're, you know, one of those people who's diving into freezing cold lakes and that sort of thing, as much as it might have some Wim Hof style benefits, Hell it's yeah. not actually helping your recovery that much. Yeah, um, we're not saying and- don't take ice baths or don't use cold therapy or or, or even hot therapy's been shown, shown to be some to do some good as well. Yeah. Um, but two real poor points, or actually, let's make three points about this thing. Number one. Right about all, all these, so you can you can take your your jigsaws, your buffers, your massages. I guess we can put the recovery pants in there, or the mm-hmm. you know the skins. Like we can take all of these and we can put them into a box, and we can label the box with these three things. Right. Firstly, um, like we say, it interferes with your body's natural recovery mechanisms, yeah. which your body's doing to try and adapt you to make you better like stronger um grow muscle those sorts of things so off season you want to really avoid these but uh we'll go to the second point now whereas if you're in season if it makes you feel good it's probably doing something but we and i say we like the scientific community we still don't know 
quite what it does. It makes you feel good, which helps your recovery. It's essentially as good as uh, explanation as you can. It doesn't actually affect your tissue because if it affected your tissue, like um, Dr. Quinn Hannock used a good example where he said, if you took a barbell squat and you had 100 kilos on your back, think how much more pressure that is on your tissue than a foam roller going in that same area. It's not mm. like your, your muscles would just turn into mush it just that's not how it works yep. there's something about being like touched or, or rubbed and or whatever it is hey it fucking feels good and that helps your recovery because feeling good helps you recover so don't go in if you if you go into it saying this is shit it sucks this isn't going to help me then probably that's gonna that's that's gonna be a self-fulfilling prophecy but Mate, anything that anything gives you that feeling that it's working uh, is going to have some positive effect. Like, Especially that's what the whole for placebo effect is. Recovery. Yeah, it's, like, like you, people need to understand what placebo really means. Yeah, like if, if you know, having your head stroked while you're falling asleep is something you think is going to help you with recovery, then it probably is actually going to help you with recovery, but yeah. probably only you. And um, the, the, the one thing that I would say is constant with all the methods that we've spoken about here, the ice, the compression, the special pants, the massage, yep. it's increasing blood flow. Yeah. Um, and you, you don't have to use special pants or a special jigsaw with a ball on the end of it or, or anything like that. Like you can increase blood flow by just moving. So like the, all these things help you do it. You know, if you're sitting on your ass doing nothing or sitting in a cold bath or having someone rub you. And if that's your preferred method, go nuts. Like if it's working for you, keep doing it. Yeah. But the, the key thing behind all these ones is blood flow. Yeah. And actually, just to touch on blood flow real quick, um, when we were talking about the training volume, like that's because I can imagine the people ask the question, well, if you go in and do 50%, what's the point of that? Well, actually, that's exactly what. It gets the blood flow into the muscles, which helps them recover better. Yeah, definitely. Like People who actually have injuries will train the same movement pattern that caused the injury, but at a much lighter load, just to get that blood back in there and get a healing faster. Yeah, and, and and actually I'll just add a note to that as well because we're talking about, if we're talking about training volume, it's really important to understand this. Um, you don't add in a recovery session to make you feel recovered. You replace a training session with a recovery session to make exactly. you more recovered. You don't add more work to make you recovered. That's just going to be more work. What you do is you take work away and replace it with the lighter stuff so you're still getting that blood flow and you're still getting all the benefit. Yeah, and if you're not deloading semi-regularly, um, you know, you're leaving some recovery on the table, whether that's, you know, in season, off season, whatever, the frequency will change, but you have to deload. Otherwise yeah. you're leaving recovery on the table and you're also leaving gains on the table. Yeah. Because you can't just keep putting your volume up and up and up and up and up. Eventually you'll need to deload because that fatigue catches up with you. Exactly. Um, we, we can't all train like Goku. Yeah. And then to, to add to my last point, so I said there was three points about these uh, performance-related uh, recovery methods that are all in this box. So yes, they are, you know, they're about getting you back to your baseline and not above it. And they work because they kind of make you feel good. Um, you know, it's, it's more about the mind than it is the body. And then my third point is all of this stuff is being sold to you pretty much. Like it's not yeah. like sleep. You know that's 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 the freest thing that you can get. Nutrition, mm -hmm. like you're doing that anyway. Volume, like you're doing that anyway. Those are things that you can really control. All the other sort of stuff, like it's just it's just more marketing. And there's not a lot of science to show that any of this does any good, except for like I say, how's your mind feeling good? Which is, um, you know, why not spend use that money? Take your missus to the movies. Go watch a movie. That's gonna make you feel good as well. Exactly. Um, uh, all this stuff. Like it's probably the thing that people spend 90% or 95% of the money on. That's only doing like 5% difference. And if you're not in a position where uh, you're at the elite of a sport or something like that, it's probably not really worth the time or the money. Yeah. The easiest way to be recovered is in season is to train less and have a smart training program or just mm -hmm. have a smart training program. Well, you could actually train more, but have your program laid out for you smartly and the same thing for off season. The best way to feel recovered is to understand that maybe you're not supposed to feel recovered all the time. Maybe you're trying to get better. But if you know you've got a well laid out program, you're going to be in a good way. Exactly.
Beautiful. All right, mate. Uh, I think we'll end it there. Have you got any other closing thoughts on recovery? No, mate. Um, uh, I think we've pretty much covered it all there. Uh, it's going to be different for everybody. So, you know, the methods that we've listed in the podcast aren't exhaustive. Um, and, yeah. you know, if you like the fucking jigsaw gun whacking away at your adductor or, or a little bit higher, you know, it, it's up to you, man. Like, yeah. if, if that's what makes you feel good, do it. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll end on the fact that, like, remember that just that, that, that point is so key is that you don't just add in extra recovery. Recovery comes from doing less and, mm -hmm. like, just being really, really proactive about it as best you can. Yeah, exactly. All right, guys. Thank you, much for, ugh, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you in the next podcast. All right, guys, thank you very much for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode or if you've enjoyed any episode of the Robbie Muscle Podcast, please go ahead and give us a five-star rating and type a quick review. It takes about a minute and it really helps us out a ton, helps grow the show, helps grow Rugby Muscle. And in turn, we will be able to give you guys the best quality content, information and programs that we possibly can. If you're interested in any of that stuff, like the free physique nutrition video series or the TJ Strength Supplement Guide or the 50 free rugby conditioning sessions, you can find them all at rugby-muscle.com or by going through my Instagram profile at tj.strength. Give me a quick follow. And until next time, guys, I've been your host as always, TJ. See you soon.